So today is Independence Day for a lot of the Latin American countries or yeah, countries. So we're here to talk about that. But before we get started with that, I do want to give you a little bit of the background between the relationship between AACUC and NELCUP. So AACUC and NELCUP partnered in 2020 to drive greater diversity, equity, and inclusion amongst credit unions. Both organizations came together to embrace and adopt that eighth cooperative principle, diversity, equity, and inclusion that was penned by our very own Maurice R. Smith, who is the retired CEO of local government federal credit union and civic federal credit union. Now, AACUC and NELCUP endeavors to provide actionable strategies, advice, guidance, and networking opportunities to credit union organizations that are interested in embracing this eighth cooperative principle in a meaningful way. ACUC and NELCUP were created many years ago to support the color majority leadership within the credit union industry and have become instrumental in advancing DEI values and that commitment in the credit union movement. Now, one of the many ways AACUC and NELCUP collaborate is DEI Tuesday. If you've been to conferences, you are familiar with it. This is an initiative that was created when Inclusive joined AACUC and NELCUP in our combined effort to ensure that members of credit unions are serviced by people that look like they do and have similar life experiences. Originally, this was rolled out at GAC, but since then, DEI Tuesday, DEI Tuesday has been embraced by a growing number of organizations to recognize these efforts during their respective conventions or conferences. And we hope to continue that wonderful DEI Tuesday. Now with that, I am going to introduce our amazing moderator for today, Maria Martinez. Hi, SP, and hi, everybody. And thank you. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to be moderating this panel, this amazing panel. And I'm going to start by introducing them. So we have with us four amazing panelists today, and it's Barbara Mojica, and she is our executive director for the National Association of Latino Credit Unions and Professionals. So welcome, Barbara. And then we have Pablo De Felipe, and he's the executive VP of Inclusive, and everybody knows Pablo, so I shouldn't even have to introduce him. <laughs> and then we have Ms. Samira Salem, and she's the vice president of DEI with CUNA, and I've worked with with her in several occasions, has been part of the CUNA board. So thank you for being here, Samira. And last but not least, we have Victor Coro, CEO of Coopera Consulting. So welcome. I, I've known these four individuals for many years, some more than others. And I'm going to start off by asking a question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question of the four of you, but I'm going to start by picking on Barbara first. So, um, Barbara, you're a very well-known and respected leader in our uh, credit in industry. I know you're probably the youngest of all of us, but so far you've made a lot of trends already in our in our industry. Why get involved in financial inclusion and, com and community development? And can you speak of a defining moment that puts you in this path? Yeah, thank you, Maria, for the introduction <clears throat> and for calling on me first. Um, for me, it's very simple. I know that if a credit union was involved in my life at a very early age, my path would have been a little bit different, um, especially when it regarded to higher education. So that really it has inspired me to, to bring financial inclusion to communities like the ones that I grew up in, the communities that, you know, are underserved, which is where I grew up most of my life. And the defining moment for me in my career in the credit union industry was when I had a sit down with my previous CEO at that time where I used to work. Um, I explained to him what the needs of my community were, the things that needed to be changed at that credit union specifically. And those changes were quickly implemented by the CEO and, and the team. And that just really opened my eyes to knowing, okay, I'm at, at a place where my values and my morals align. And credit unions really do walk the walk or walk the talk, you know, um, they're, they're able to listen to you and make those changes that they know, you know, these communities that they're serving are, are in need. So that really changed my life and, and the way I thought about credit unions. And that's why 
you know, ever since that day, I decided that the credit union industry is where I want to be and where I want my career to be centered for. So thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Pablo, tell us why. Why? Um, por qué? Por qué? Um, well, to me, like to everyone, this is personal, right? I came to this country many years ago. I had long hair back then. <laughs> and uh, I was confronted with the reality that that uh, that almost you were forced to be born again. So I came to the US in the 90s and luckily my dad um, was a member of a crane in New York City. So the, you know, I arrived on a Saturday on a Monday morning, we were opening an account because he said very wisely, in this country without uh, a bank account, you cannot function. Uh, but that's only half of the story, right? Having a bank account, it's just the first step. The second step is, is getting a loan. And, and you cannot get a loan if you don't have a credit history. So you're in this you know, chicken and egg type of game. Oh, you need the loan, but you don't have the credit history. So come back when you have the credit history. But if nobody gives you the loan, how do you build it? And that was to me, uh, not only frustrating, but I realized that I wasn't the only one. And that really set me down this path where Cranus became, you know, the instrument by which we can really promote financial inclusion and racial, racial equity, but only if we are willing to do the second half, which is if we're willing to finance and to do the to bring the capital to uh, to immigrants and Latinos, and that's really where the big opportunity is as well. So that kind of you know dictated my whole you know professional career here in this country, and I'm just happy that we have such a vibrant and committed creating a system because we're making a difference. Yes, de definitely. Uh, next, I have uh, Samira, and uh, I remember Samira sitting in one of the CUNA board meetings. And you walked in to give uh, your presentation. And I was admiring you as a Hispanic woman walking into the room, into a, a, a room full of a lot of knowledge. And then you gave your presentation and I was like, wow, there are people out there that can do this job and they can do it and they can do it so good. So Samira, tell us about your path and why. Oh my gosh, Maria. Um, that really, I really appreciate you for for sharing that, um, it was amazing for me to walk in and see you there. Uh -huh. Thank you. And consistently see you there and consistently see you speaking up. Um, and, and so, yeah, when we talk about representation matters, it's not just a saying, it is so true. Um, so, so thank you for this opportunity, Maria, and uh, big thanks to AACUC for making this happen, for, for inviting me to be a part of this conversation with such amazing colleagues. Um, I have a, a slightly different story because I am the child of immigrants. Um, so my mother immigrated from Guatemala. Um, so I'm second generation. Um, but the, the exposure to the travel to Guatemala um, you know, really opened my eyes at a very young age. I remember being seven years old. You talk about a defining moment. Um, seven years old, uh, visiting my grandparents. They had a really small pineapple farm. So it was a big treat to go there and eat pineapples on the side of the street. And just, I remember all the juice stripping. It's very very visual so I can remember ex exactly what it looked and felt like. And as I was eating this pineapple um, on the side of the street, on the side of the road, um, I, I saw a young child who was about my age, give or take, um, you know, not too far away and they weren't wearing any clothes, right? And their, their belly looked kind of large and 
I just asked my grandparents, who is this? And why why aren't they wearing any clothes? And and it was um a real stark moment for me that there are inequalities, really stark inequalities. It just felt so wrong to me. Um, and you know, it, it just was that first moment. And I can never get that vision out of my head. And that is what has propelled my entire career, whether I was doing international economic development, working on issues of poverty, or, you know, working um, on community development, um, or, you know, in my the place where I am right now, um, you know, this idea of economic justice and social justice and ensuring that um, these kinds of deep disparities um, don't exist and we can ensure that folks can walk a life of dignity um, and just basic, have at least the basic human needs met. Um, so I fortunately was able to, to weave a career that allowed me to connect my, my heart and my head and, and to do something about it. And that eventually led me to the credit union movement and much like Barbara, that idea of being able to work in a place where your values uh, align with what you're able to do. I mean, it's the most gratifying thing I can ever imagine. And um, just in being able to work with folks like you, I mean, even better, so. And, and I think that's why many of us never leave this industry because of the, the the way that we can give back. This industry just, you know, it's one of those that it embraces you so that you can give back. In many other industries, they don't do that. You, all you do is work, work, work. But here we can do more than that. And that leads me into Victor. And Victor, I know you've done a lot of work in our industry and especially the work being done to serve the Hispanic community. Uh, so tell me why and uh, what the, what's the, the defining moment in, that put you in this path. Well, thank you, Maria. And uh, shout out to the African-American Coalition. Uh, you know, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's, it's just great to kick off the Hispanic Heritage Month just like this in this wonderful gathering. Uh, thanks again, acknowledgement. Uh, mi por qué, mi, eh, el, the why, right? Uh, the, the why is, is the opportunity to really work in something that has meaning. And, you know, when we talk about credit unions, we talk about humans, we talk about community, we talk about development, we talk about growth, we talk about betterment, we talk about inclusion, we talk about access, we talk about well-being. All those things have meanings and all those things actually are conducive to improve the human condition. That's, that's really the why, you know, of why, why I spend my energy, my time, my days, my, my uh, sweat, blood and tears in 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 this wonderful uh community this wonderful movement that is the credit union system in terms of a defining moment you know um i'm first generation an immigrant from panama and i came to this country in a blinding snowstorm in january to wisconsin never lived a day uh under 80 uh, uh under 80 degrees in panama and so, you know, that was a defining moment for me, but I have to go back a little bit and I have to tell you all, and probably you've heard this from me before, my parents did start a credit union in my native Panama. You know, uh, when I was a, I was a teenager, uh, you know, I remember all, and they, both my mom and dad, uh, teachers, I had all these teachers in my living room all the time. Every night they have meetings that I have no idea why, and they were starting a credit union. They had no access to financial services. They, they were marginalized in many ways, and they found their own solution, which was creating a credit union. My mother was a uh, number one member. My dad was number two members. They were chair, the co-chairs of the credit union. For many years, that happened in my house, and I didn't understand it. For some um, coincidence of the destiny, I ended up at the University of Wisconsin through a Fulbright scholarship you know, uh, funded by the U.S. government, by the American embassy in Panama. I came to study at the, you know, uh, in, in Wisconsin, did not know any English. And, you know, I'll fast forward, you know, four years, 
And then I find, well, actually, the World Council of Christians found me, you know, to work there. And I spent 20 years working at the World Council of Credit Unions, in um, which I was able to travel for, uh, to more than 90 countries where credit unions existed. Connect those two facts, my parents studying a credit union and me working at the World Council of Credit Unions in Madison, Wisconsin. With a, It was just a total coincidence. So, you know, for many reasons, I think I was destined to work in this movement in this beautiful community. And when I travel to this 90 countries, uh, creating exchange opportunities for actually worlds to actually see each other, to connect, you know, and the connection was that wonderful cooperative business model. And so, you know, that is, it's something that is absolutely fascinating to me that a group of people can actually get together and then create good amongst them. So, you know, I was put in the middle of uh, those exchange opportunities, you know, uh, connecting people from the middle of Iowa to the to people from to the middle of Panama. And somehow or another, this is was the genesis of Copera Consulting, where I found myself now working for the last six years. And, you know, it's just been a, a wonderful, a wonderful coincidence uh, and uh, several pivotal moments. So, yes, it's, it's been, uh, really great to, you know, to be in this space. And, you know, I relish that. So thanks for the question. Yeah, and, and especially, Victor, you know, helping so many credit unions understand why we should be serving Latinos and Hispanics. And I think that's so important. And I think your your consulting company does that. They help credit unions understand why. So thank you so much for that. My next question, and I'm going to start with Pablo on this one. Uh, so we're celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, Nuestra Herencia Hispana. And uh, we know that Latinos, we're not a monolithic culture. We know that. Could you speak to that uh, and uh, to that uniqueness and diversity and uh, also what unifies our community? Yeah, um, it's a great question, Maria, because, you know, oftentimes people tend to make these generalizations that are very harmful. Um, I remember years ago, one of my, my kids coming back from from school, you know, saying that uh, someone asked me if I spoke Mexican. And, you know, we are Chileans, um, it's like the difference, you know, we share the language, but we have different um, uh, traditions, you know. Um, and I think that there's a lot of ignorance about, you know, what it means to be Latino or Hispanic that that is important to put out there. Uh, we love Mexico as a country, as a culture, but the Chilean culture is different, you know, and uh, it's important for people to understand those nuances because there are things that are, that can be offensive. Language unifies Latinos. We all speak it, but the meaning of worlds are very different, you know, one time, uh, Victor and I did this exercise. Um, we were in front of a group of people and we were saying, you know, things like guagua. So guagua in Chile is a baby. Guagua in Puerto Rico is a bus. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, so we started making, you know, this little exchange and it was really funny because we realized that words that, you know, in Chilean, maybe very innocuous, inoffensive, could be actually very offensive in other, you know, countries, you know. So it's important to recognize that, um, to understand who you're talking to, you know, especially because we are trying to build trust in communities. And if you, by not doing a little bit of your homework, you know, make those mistakes, you know, then people, are not gonna trust you. Then they're not gonna they're gonna see it right through you that you're not really being thorough in your approach because you have to know people. Um, so language unifies us. Uh, 
food is something that I want to really point out. I love food and every country does something very different. You know, so one way, you know, one advice to you is that if you really want to know a country, experience the food. It's incredible how much you can learn through that experience. Um, I think that you had one more question, Maria, about. Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll come uh, back to that one. I'll, I'll come. I left okay. that one alone because I think that might be yes. a little bit different. Yeah. Okay, yes. okay Kepa. Next. But, thank you, sir. Thank you. And, you know, I've, I've met Pablo many years ago. I believe Pablo was in San Antonio, right? At that, uh, it was a, a Latino Caribbean conference. That's that right. Back in 1999, and he did have hair at the time. I remember that. <laughs> but one thing that attracted me to Pablo, it's you know, I'm I'm very hyper, but this guy he beats me. He's more hyper than I am, and and, and I, but I I loved it when I I could hear the conversations that he was having with some of the attendees there, and that attracted me to him. And uh, ever since we've been very good friends and, you know, we were part of, you know, putting Nalk up in place and we're so excited about this. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So next uh, I'll go on to Victor. I'll go back to Victor. Uh, same question, you know, we're celebrating uh, Latinos, Hispanic uh, Heritage Month. Uh, can you speak a little bit about what unifies our community? Yeah. One of the things that unifies our community, like, like, um, um Pablo mentioned is is the uh the language Spanish uh but also you know we have a colonial history with Spain you know that's that's an interesting thing uh to to mention and we have a lot of uh, traditions that come from that you know the Catholic uh faith Christianity you know it's something that unifies us as well in, in many ways and you know the rituals that go with that. But the interesting thing that, uh, you know, at the same time unifies us here in the United States is a really uh, nuanced existence. Uh, many Latinos, many families that are here in the United States may feel like they still navigate or live in two realities, two worlds. What is it to be in America and what is it to be, uh, uh, you know, from a Hispanic heritage? So that's something that, you know, is very important to actually understand uh, when it comes to uh, serving this community in a way that is culturally relevant, um, you know, the, there's there's a movie, and I th I think it was about the life of Selena. Nidia Kinida, yeah, we're not neither from here nor from there, and many times, you know, that's that's a reality because uh, you know folks can question your american uh americanness you know how to the degree to which you are american you could be here but you know what you when you're here while latino your identity may be actually questioned you know that sense of belonging is something that is really interesting to understand when it comes to our uh our heritage and it's a shared trait between many people within the the hispanic community uh, but yeah, that's that's something that I would say unifies us. And when it comes down to to the business, you know, to credit unions, the more that we know about this lived experience, the more that 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 you know that Latinos may feel that they're from two worlds, that identity is very personal as well. Uh, you know, that that's important to be relevant. So I'll stop there uh, and I'll let others share. And uh, thank you, Victor. And I'm gonna move on to Barbara. And Barbara has a, a unique story, and I don't know if many of you know this, but uh, she is a DACA recipient. And uh, so she's had different struggles and coming from a young woman, you know, what? tell me a little bit uh, about Barbara, you know, how do you see this? Uh, what, is, what unifies her community as a young professional, as a young, young woman, and also as a DACA recipient also? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Maria. Um, well, I want to address one part of the question where, um, you know, even though we're Latinos and, and it's, it's not a mafia, like, like you said, um, even in your own countries, you have differences, right, that, that separate you from each other, um, which is like, for example, from the people from the south of Mexico have different foods, different traditions than people from the north of Mexico. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that as well, because even among your own, you know, 
culture or your um, own country, you you have those separations. Um, but I think in the United States, what unites Latinos and Latinx folks is is the struggle, right? At some point, even if you're born here, like Samira says, she's second generation, she understands the struggles of the immigration system, navigating that immigration system and and the 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 burden that it is to navigate the immigration system as a, as a whole, you know, um, I I know that when I came out as a doc and I came out sounds weird, but I, when I was public about my status um, at the credit union that I was with, so many other folks came to me and said, I'm also a DACA recipient. I thought I couldn't speak about that. And so I, I think it's very important that first it's encouraged to, to come out and say those things because we I think that that is what keeps us united here in the United States. I mean, we all have had it to experience immigration at some point. Maria, you experienced it back when the amnesty happened. You know, I've experienced it multiple times through since I was 18. Um, and so to me, that is one of the biggest things that unites us here in the country is the navigating the immigration system. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for those words. And and, and Samira, same question. Um, I know you you were for uh, CUNA, you know, being a, a very big national association that caters to so many uh, credit unions. And you know that be, seeing the diversity also. Tell me, you know, what? How do you see this? What unifies our community and also within the credit union community? Yeah. Um... Gosh, everyone has spoken so eloquently about what unifies uh, our community. Absolutely, yes, language. But then if you look at the nuance, there's Spanish, but there's also indigenous languages and people forget about that, right? Um, there are folks that, that don't speak Spanish. They come from Central America. They come from other countries in Latin America. And um, so, you know, I think that's the language is yes, for the majority, an important piece of it. The struggle, I completely agree with that. This idea of the, the colonial history, Victor, completely love that. And, and I think it's so true because that does give way to a lot of a lot of the, the rituals and a lot of the trauma. <laughs> a lot of the trauma that our communities um, have faced and the intergenerational trauma that is passed down, right, that we all carry in our genes to this day. And so whether you come from Guatemala, whether you come from Mexico, whether you come from Peru, you know, there is that that history that, that connects us. Um, you know, certainly there are, you know, 20 or so, Victor can correct me, um, countries from which Latinos hail from. If you add Hispanic, it's even more. Um, and I think, you know, uh, certainly we need to, to be thinking about um, things like that connect us like um, multi-generational households, right? From the perspective of uh, the financial services industry, we are a group who tends to have multi-generational households. So what does that mean for our finances, right? Um, we need to be thinking about that. And I know we, we hopefully will get to talk a little bit about wealth and wealth generation and intergenerational wealth transfer, but what does that look like when you've got multi-generational households? Um, and, and that's another thing that I think we, we tend to connect with others on. Another thing which I, I've, feel like I was surprised nobody mentioned it, but um, things like um, Minas de Pasión, like my mom is watching it right now. I'm sure some of your mothers or grandmothers or what have you are watching that and are chatting with my mom's from Guatemala. She's talking with her best friend from Puerto Rico and her other friend from Honduras about it. And I get the, the secondhand gossip. And, you know, I mean, it passes from generation to generation. These are the telenovelas, the stories and the rich storytelling, which is such an important part of our culture. So it's, you know, I, I know I've kind of gone a little bit everywhere, but there's a lot that unites us. But then 
there's a lot of nuance, as Victor was saying, and there's a lot of intersectionality that we don't talk about. We have 3.8 million Afro-Latinos in the United States, right? Um, we have 1.1 million Asian Latinos in the United States. Um, I don't know how many Arab Latinos there are, but you got one right here, right? We I haven't been able to find that number. I'm looking for it. Um, you know, over 2 million LGBTQIA plus Latinos. Um, and so we really do have this beautiful tapestry. Um, and, you know, even though our first stop might be to say, oh, I'm from Guatemala, ultimately, I think folks do somehow, it, that, that Latino identity, at least in the U.S., does resonate with people and, and does connect us in a very, very powerful way. So... And, and Samira, you mentioned the the novelas, and um, you know, I was thinking about my my husband when he moved to this country. He wanted to learn English, and uh, he would watch a Love Boat. Maybe maybe many of you don't know Love Boat, but uh, he says if you know if I can understand, you know what they're saying, I can learn. But he also said that if I, whenever I can understand Willie Nelson's uh, lyrics of his songs, then I know I've learned English. <laughs> but it's true. I think the novelas you know, the soul poppers, you know, we learn so much from them because it's our culture. But I think when we embed ourselves into a new culture, like when we came to the States, we ended up watching the, you know, the soul poppers here so that we can embed ourselves into the culture. So it, it goes hand in hand. But yeah, it's so funny. And, and you can also watch the Narcos one, you know, and you, you, you learn some things. <laughs> and my mom watched General Hospital when she first immigrated here. Yes. That was the one for her, yeah. right? Oh my gosh. That's true. That's so funny. Okay. Next next question, Victor. I'm gonna go to Victor because I know you get asked this so much, Victor. Latino, Hispanic, Latinx. What is it? What is it? You know, um I've come to the conclusion that all of those are imperfect labels to try to define an elusive demographic. And so they're all right. None of them are wrong. You know, it really depends on what you define. I myself, usually, if nobody knows me and they ask me, so what's your heritage? I'll say, you know, I was born in Panama and I'm American now, you know, and usually there's always this follow up question, you know, so where are you really from? So, again, this alludes to my um you know, my sense, sense of belonging and the identity of being Latino. But, you know, Latino, Hispanic, Latinx, you know, what we, what I say is like, define it as you wanted it to, to be defined and then put the label on yourself. You know, we are all individuals and we see this very differently. You know, uh, with Pablo, I think we say Latino, but if you ask, uh, and with Juan uh, Fernandez from the, you know, the Louisiana League, we're always discussing this, you know, is it, is it, is it uh, Hispanic? Is it Latino? Again, is, is an imperfect, uh, imperfect terms. Uh, and we're trying to actually, you know, fit such a nuanced and rich community that it depends on what generation they're from, what country they came from, what level of English they speak. They will tell you whether they're Hispanic, Latino, or, or, or um, Latinx. If you're a credit union, I would just define it somewhere and say, we may use these terms interchangeably because this means, you know, uh, the same thing for same people, uh, different things for, for, but it's just trying to put, you know, a label on, on something that is hard to define. And that's, you know, that's, that's uh, the identity of an American uh, Hispanic person. It's nuanced, it's complex, and it depends on the day. <laughs> yeah, and, and I know so many people are against the Latinx but, you know, you ask uh, a millennial or younger generations and for them is that's the way it is, Latinx, and, and they're going to fight it. And I think we need to accept it uh, yeah. you know, because we're all one and the same. So, you know, uh, Pablo or, or Samira yeah. or Barbara, y'all have, you know. You know, Maria, I think that uh, I really had a hard time putting myself in a bucket because in Chile, you don't define yourself by a label. You know, uh, our countries are a lot more homogeneous in that respect. All of that's changing, 
but it was uh, hard for me to put a label every time that I, you know, completed a, a form or something. What am I? And I'm a human being, yes. you know, and that's a little bit of of uh, of um, of a cultural shock uh, that you know one thing that you learn to do in this country is to kind of classify yourself. And it shouldn't be like that. Um, and that becomes normalized. And I think that that's wrong. Um, so, but that's, I guess, you know, the the way that the system, you know, keeps count of people. Um, I resented it initially, and then you get used to it, right? Yeah, well, I'm Latino or Hispanic. Um, but I think that it's, it's, um, it's a futile attempt to classify people in buckets that are, as Victor say, so hard to define. And as we become more um, uh, diverse, I mean, what Samida said about that intersectionality, it's so important that's gonna be harder and harder to define. And, why is it that we have to be forced to kind of pick and choose? You know, it's hard. So I'm gonna just leave it there. It, it's just a hard thing to do. And I'm sorry that that we're so used to classifying ourselves in some sort of bucket. Yeah, it's, it's true. Barbara, you wanna add something to that? Yeah, and I'll bring it back even to the question asked prior, I think, in our countries, those labels don't, you don't have to have them because you're in your place of home. Um, I remember I got the opportunity to go back to Mexico two years ago under DACA, and that was my first time since I migrated here. And it's actually the first time I felt as part of something. And I get emotional because it's such a um, weird experience to be somewhere where there's rarely any racism at all, even probably because they see you as one of them. So I don't have to walk up to people and tell them I'm Latina, Latina, Latinx, because that's an assumption already there, um, which is such a beautiful experience, right? And I think that's why, Pablo, you feel like you were angry because you didn't have to do that before you grew up in Chile, you know, versus me. I grew up here and I feel like labels are important because I don't want to be classified as, as anything else but my heritage. I want to hold on to my heritage. I want to hold on to every aspect um, that my parents have taught me. And that's why labels to me were important and are still continue to be important that people recognize me as a Latina woman. Um, in terms of the words, I think language is always evolving. Um, it's it's always evolving. No matter if we want to resist that change or not, that, that change is going to be there. And I'm going to speak for my generation and the generation that's coming after me. I mean, we do not like the word Hispanic. We don't. Hispanic is a term used by colonizers. Colonizers, the Spaniards who colonized our countries. And my generation wants to be called Latinos, Latine, Latinx folks, right? So um, I, I I think it's really, really important to start accepting that as a credit union. And I'm not saying you should get rid of the word Hispanic completely because there's other generations that do accept that and they, they feel part of that, you know, culture. But I do think that from, if you're trying to attract new members, we know that members at credit unions are aging out. If you're trying to attract these generations, you have to move into that space and make that step to being inclusive of everyone. I just read a study that one third of Gen Zers identify in the LGBT community. That means that more, a lot of those folks are going to identify with the word Latinx, Latina. And so do you really want to leave behind a whole group of people just because you don't like that, you know, maybe Latinx is Americanized, maybe it is, but we are in this country where there's so many identities, so many groups of folks. So, you know, it's it's really important to adopt the, the evolving of a language. Now, I don't know at all about this subject, but I, I've been trying to learn this myself. So I'm just gonna tell you all in our next book club, meeting where we are going to read about these words <laughs> and then I invite you all so that we can all learn together what really do does it mean to um, be Latinx, Latina or Latina, Latino, Hispanic and, and the heritage of those words. So 
I think we just need more education on this and hopefully we can make a collective decision that empowers all people and doesn't leave um, anyone behind. So. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for your energy and your passion. Uh, and, it, and it's true. I think, uh, and Barbara and I have had this conversation before, you know, we go back and forth. Of course, we're from two different generations. So, you know, we can we can argue the point. But but I think it's important that we know that we're all in this together. Yeah. And that's the main thing. And, you know, and just like, you know, when my kids were growing up, you know, you tell your kids, you got to respect others. You know, that's that's what comes first. You know, you got to respect others. And we know that as Hispanics, as Latinos, as Latinx, you know, we're all together for a purpose. And, you know, it's it's important. Samina, did you want to add anything else <laughs> to this topic? Uh, yeah, um, I think one of the things that what Barbara shared is that what's important is to ask people how they yes. want to be referred to. Just ask them. Right. I agree with with Barbara. I prefer Latina, hands down. My mother also prefers that, by the way. So it's, you know, it, it you can think of it as a generational thing, but it may not be. Um, but then, you know, there's research that shows that there's still a quarter of, of folks out there that prefer Hispanic. So it's, again, ask people how they want to be referred to. And I think that's the best thing that you can do. Language is dynamic. We are constantly learning um, and, and, and understanding ourselves better and understanding how we want to talk about ourselves. And, and back to the point about um, using these terms at all. Um, I, I think in the US, um, identity is politicized, right? And going back to what Barbara had said about what unifies us is the struggle, right? Um, the struggle against racism, the struggle against systems that perpetuate inequities. Um, and in order to unify our voices, it's useful to have terms and groupings like Latinos, Latinas, Latinx, Latine, right? Um, it is because we have a system that's set up in the way that it's set up that we, we need to have these, um, these labels, at least for now. Hopefully there will be one day where I saw somebody said in terrestrials we can <laughs> we can be human right but but we're not there here yet yeah. we we still do have the struggle and um, it also means resources right right um so when you count yourself in the census or etc cetera, etc cetera. so um yeah that's all I have I wanted to add one thing you know in terms of this identity struggle because um, sometimes we talk about this with currently unions. You know, Lat the United States is probably the second largest Latin American country. It's 62 million people with Latin American uh, heritage is the second country in the world that speaks Spanish. Mm -hmm. But just do a, a simple Google search and put true American and then go to images and see what comes up. Put Latino as a word and see an image is what comes up. Stereotypical things that basically says Latino people are only one thing and they are different from mainstream America. Mm -hmm. But 62 million people strong, it's a mainstream market and we have been treated as a niche for a long, long time. And that's an interesting thing. And I think it's gonna start changing very soon when the economic power, when the entrepreneurial uh, spirit of this community, you know, really comes and saves the economy in the country. It's something very interesting to, to observe uh, now that we're talking about labels and identity. We do that with credit unions all the time. We do, and, and Victor, that just brings us into the next question that I have, you know, the credit unions were very well positioned to serve in the Hispanic Latino community, Latinx community. However, we're not the primary financial institution. And I'm wondering why, what is it that we're doing wrong? Why is it that we can't position ourselves as the, the uh, 
it was the, el, el banco de la gente, like they would say, la cooperativa de la gente. Why can't we position ourselves like that? And, and I know we still have a lot to do, but I'll, I'll start with Samira. You know, Samira, I know you've done some work on this. Um, tell me, Samira, what, why, why can't we do it? Um, gosh, you know, we have done some thinking on this and I often will turn to Victor or Pablo. Yeah. And um, so they will probably have the real reason. I'll give you like my <laughs> ideas. <laughs> um, I, you know, there, there's a, several things. And, and again, we're such a complex community. So if you're talking about first generation immigrants to the US, there could be a history of cooperativas in their country that may not be very positive, right? Um, and so they come here with that history and there is a trust issue from the get-go, right? Um, the, the other piece of it might be that you, again, first generation folks, when you have the term federal in, you know, federal credit union, immediately they, they, they start getting nervous. Like, you know, the authorities, right? Not that they necessarily have anything to, 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 to hide, but when Latinos and authorities come together, it's not always the most pleasant <laughs> experience, right? Um, and so there's, there's that. I mean, those are kind of a couple of anecdotal um, uh, I, ideas that, you know, we, we'd kind of been talking about. I, there's no real hard data to support that, but it feels like there might be something there. Um, and it also, this idea that when, you know, especially as an immigrant, when you finally do feel like you're in a position to bank going to a banco, right? That feels like you've made it right? There's something there, um, like a, a, almost like a status thing. So those are kind of, you know, for that first gen, that's kind of what, what might be going on. And then when it comes to, you know, second generation folks that have maybe been here a little bit longer, I would love to see the data and the breakdown you know, between generations, we don't, we, again, we don't have that data. Do we see a discrepancy? Do we see more of the second generation folks actually, um, uh, you know, joining credit unions at a higher percentage, or are they following, you know, their, their, their parents, their first gens? Um, and is that somehow influenced? I don't know what the data is there, but I do know that another thing that is important and incumbent upon credit unions is if you've got these potential barriers, right? Reputation barriers, then guess what? We need to work extra hard to go out and to welcome and to understand all of these communities and to ensure that we are welcoming those that are documented, undocumented, um, and, and we are providing them with an experience where they feel the moment they step in our doors, they're welcome, they belong, right? That's, that depend, that's really on us. And we actually need to go out into the community and be there in the community events, right? And and have our little stand and talk to people and, and really welcome them in that way by going out. Um, so I, I feel like there might be a repu not reputation, but but just a, a stigmatism or stig stigma, not stigmatism, stigma against credit unions, but we need to break through. We also know that many times there's a major trust issue um, with uh, Latino communities um, and just not knowing that if, even if I have $5, guess what? I can open up an account and I'm welcome. The final thing I wanna say here is when they do come in the door, um, let's make sure that we're providing affordable products, mm -hmm. right? Um, that just because they're Latinos <laughs> doesn't mean that they're higher risk ne necessarily because that's that's some of the the stereotypes and you know we need to ensure that we're providing them with the sorts of products and services that meet their needs that are affordable 
um, for for them. So I'll I'll stop there. Yeah, and and also Samira, I think uh, people feel more comfortable when they walk into a place where they see people that look like them. I think it, it is just like anything. I mean, when you hang out with groups, you feel more comfortable hanging around with a group that's more like you. I don't care where you go, whether you go to the bar or whether you go to a festival, but you always tend to go to a place where you feel like you're welcomed. And I think our credit union industry needs to be it needs to do more work on that. And and I'm gonna jump over to Barbara because I, I know some of the things that you're facing right now, Barbara, in getting credit unions to commit to serving the Hispanic community, you know, has been that that maybe they don't have access to having employees that could speak the language or to serve them. But tell me a little bit about Barbara, but maybe what are some of the challenges here? Um, I'm going to speak from a younger generation point of view. Um, we see fintechs because you even think about it. My generation is not even banking with just banks. They're doing the fintech route. Um, and that's because they're on your face 24 seven through social media. And we consume social media like crazy, sometimes a little bit too much, to be honest. Um, so you automatically start associating, you know, oh, they can help me here. I've seen them on TikTok. And so I think credit unions don't do a good job at marketing um, outside of their own membership. You know, how can we as a collective industry form that sort of presence in social media and meet people where they are, right? Another aspect of this is, for example, here, and this might not be the case in every state, um, but I'll speak to the North Carolina states, specifically here in Raleigh, North Carolina. They have the Lime Latino Festival this weekend. And they have all these sort of sponsors. You have Wells Fargo there. You have PNC. Not one single credit union has a table there. Not one single credit union. How is the community supposed to learn about the credit union movement where we are not meeting them where they are? You know, so I think it's very important to really integrate yourself into the community. Another example, quickly, Rebelde. I know that if you're Latino, you know what Rebelde is. I saw them two weeks ago. Wells Fargo had a table. There was 15,000 attendees, all Latinos, because it's it's a major concert, you know, and and I, in my thoughts, I'm like, okay, well, where where are we? Where is our credit union folks coming out here on a Saturday, even if handing out waters and doing what Wells Fargo is doing, you know? And so I, I really do think that we need to put more efforts into that. And I know that, you know, the resources and the staffing has to be there to do that. But community development should be essential to every credit union that is trying to tap into the Latino market because... Latino people want you to be where they are. And, and that is how you're going to start gaining their trust in business. Um, and I had another thing to say, but I forgot, Maria. But maybe if I think about it, I will come back to it. We're going to have to do part two of this, guys, because, I mean, this is an amazing conversation on this. So I'm going to let's spend one minute each, you know, just saying the last few words, uh, something that's in your mind, and then we'll wrap it up. We'll turn it over to Espy. Uh, Barbara, you want to start? Yes, you're, I just want to say I would not be doing my job if I didn't say this, but if you want to learn more about how to empower your community, please become a member of NARCA. We do have three webinars coming up on topics um, of Latino culture, you know, statistics on Latinos. So um, just join NARCA, really. It is the first step for you to learn and empower your community and, and your professionals and the people that work for you and the people that are serving your members on the front lines. Um, so come and join us at NowCup and the book club. Cafecito con Cultura is open to everyone regardless of membership. So if you want to learn more, just join us every other Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And the conference next year. And the conference. Happen. I the hope conference. to see every single one of you there. A year from a year from today. Yeah. Okay. So put it on your calendars. Victor. Well, I would say, uh, well, thank you very much again for, for this. Um, I would say work very hard on making sure that your credit union, whatever you work, really reflects the community in which you're supposed to work. I think, you know, um, the Korean system being 90% white in its structure of power, meaning C-suite and board, actually has a lot to do with the lack of trust or the lack of Latinos in the industry. Yet this is the largest and most uh, underserved market and community in the country 
that's the youngest as well, which will bring actually relevance to the industry. So be mindful of that, be curious, use data, have a plan and a strategy, and then really have culturally uh, appropriate products and services. We can no longer be an industry of commoditized loans and commoditized deposits. Things need to actually appeal to people for them to use it and be digital. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Victor. Paulo. Um, the train left the station. So I think that we are past that point where we want to convince credit unions to serve these markets. The reality is that the market is so big that if you don't see it today, you're not gonna see it tomorrow just because you're not gonna be around to serve this market. I think that is important that we all recognize that that our job, you know, like from Coopera or inclusive or NALCAP's point of view is not to try to convince you to serve Latinos. You, you already know that. Um, I think that we've been doing this for way too long. Uh, so my message to you is a message of urgency. This is the time because the train is leaving. And as Barbara said, if we're not where Latinos are, we're just not going to be around. So yes, on the positive note, uh, one of the programs that we run at Inclusive is Juntos Avanzamos, and we have seen a huge ups upstick in terms of interest. We have right now 136 um, cranials in 28 states that are Juntos Avanzamos designated. We have a pipeline of institutions that are, um, are going through the process. So I am hopeful that, that we are seeing the light. I just wish more cranials really took action now. Thank you. La, la luz de los credit unions, the light of credit exactly. unions. Samira, Samira, please. Yeah, um, I just, I kind of want to build on what Pablo was saying, um, but take it from the other, other side of it. Um, so we know that there's a significant wealth gap between Latinos and, and uh, whites in the United States. Um, so whites hold five times as much wealth as Latinos in the U.S. Um, and there is, you know, a lot of work and speculation as to why and what can be done about it. Um, one thing I will say is um, CUNA has done some work looking at Juntos Avanzamos and the and uh, Cooperas Hispanic Outreach Program, and that is a real win-win for not only our members and helping us to uh, close that wealth gap, but but also for credit unions themselves. So um, there are some really great tools uh, available to credit unions, really great opportunities. Um, and I recommend you all take a look at it. I'm also going to drop a link in the chat. Um, Brookings has got this project looking at the Latino wealth gap in the United States, which they've uh, recently started. So I'll drop the link in the chat for you all to do a little bit more digging on what that looks like and what some potential uh, policy and other solutions to that are. Thank you, Samira. And thank you to the panelists. Uh, thank you, ACUC, for having us here and we really enjoyed this and thank you to everybody that attended and I'm going to turn this over back to SB. Uh, thank you so much Maria. And unfortunately we've ran out of time. We definitely feel like we need a part two. Such a great conversation. If you look at the chat everybody was asking questions super engaged so thank you thank you thank you for sticking with us for this hour. So many great pieces of knowledge were dropped and shared so keep learning everyone. Um, we also want to thank you for joining us for today's conversation and future ones as always. Just know that you can support AACUC through your membership, financial donations, volunteerism, and our corporate partnership. There's a link that was dropped in the chat for you to check that out and support us. I'd like to thank again my panelists and Maria for being such an amazing moderator. Thank you, thank you. Thanks to your, our AACC board of directors, chapter officers, and our staff for always being amazing and supporting us. And as usual, save the date for our next CTC conversation, which is October 20th, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
Thank you all and have a wonderful weekend. Thank <laughs> you.